In short time, both were dozing. How long they slept, they were unable to tell, but awakened with a start. Soft, shuffling sounds were heard proceeding from the floor above. Anything Ghost, episode number 309. Welcome to Anything Ghost. My name is Lex Wall. Anything Ghost is a place where people share their personal paranormal experiences or local ghost legends, and I share them with you on the show. Anything Ghost has been around since January of 2006. That makes Anything Ghost 18 years old. So instead of a sweet 16 celebration, we'll have a creepy 18 celebration. So stick around for episode number 309 of Anything Ghost. First story we have is from Angela in Bedfordshire, England. Auntie May. My dad was from Ireland and had a very tough upbringing back in the 1930s and 40s. He was in foster care from birth with a wonderful woman called May. He said his life in her cottage on the Irish coast was idyllic, as she was such a caring and loving person. One day when my dad was around seven years old, his friend's mother told him that he'd be staying at their house for the night, as his Auntie May needed to go away. In the early hours of the morning, my dad heard knocking on the bedroom window. It woke him up, so he looked out and he saw his Auntie May waving at him. He assumed that she was calling him to come home, and he quickly got dressed to leave. But he was stopped by his friend's parents, who tried to send him back to bed. They opened the door, at his insistence, to find no Auntie May. May had actually been hit by a motorbike while she was crossing the road, and she died overnight in the hospital. Later that morning, my dad was told that his precious Auntie May had gone to heaven. My dad had seen her and didn't believe that she'd gone. But he had to go back into the foster care system. This meant going back to the city in an industrial school, institutions for orphaned boys, and later on in life, a seminary, a softer option for orphaned boys, who said they'd consider the priesthood. Years before emigrating to England, he took a visit to the coastal town that held so many happy memories for him. He went to a cottage and just hovered around smoking cigarettes. Eventually a woman came out of the cottage and they chatted. Eventually the woman asked my father if she knew anything about the ghost. The woman had several children at home, and for every child, an older lady had walked into the bedroom and left through a non-existent door. She never felt afraid of this lady, just a little sad. My dad always thought that ghost may have been his beloved Auntie May that made his early childhood so wonderful. I hope they're together again. Next up is a story from Michelle in Buckeye, Arizona. Hallway Shrieker I live in Buckeye, Arizona, in a newish home built in 2004. About eight years ago, I was on a work schedule that had me waking up at 3.30 a.m. each morning to catch a 5.30 a.m. bus. One particular morning, 
I woke up at one o'clock and could not fall back to sleep. This was very annoying because I was so tired. By 1.30, I was frustrated that I was still wide awake. Suddenly, I heard a horrific, inhuman shriek that emanated from the hallway just outside of my bedroom door. I absolutely froze, except for my heart, which was pounding away. The shriek only lasted a second, but it was long enough to terrify me. After a few seconds of silence, I prayed and worked up the courage to turn on the light and I grabbed my gun, even though I knew it was not going to be of any use against what I heard in that hallway. I looked down and saw one of my dogs, a rowdy little border collie mix, standing next to the bed with her tail tucked as tight as she could, and she was shaking hard. In a way, I was glad to see her reaction because that meant I wasn't the only one who heard that thing shriek. I stood up and headed for the hallway, turning on every light as we went. There was nothing to see in the hallway, nor was there anything in the rest of the house. One of my cats was hiding under the dining table, all puffed up, so I assumed she had experienced it also. After the house was blazing with every light on, I searched for the dog and cat, both boys. They were sound asleep, lucky little brats. Us girls were still freaked out. Apparently, animals are like people, and not everyone is able to experience the paranormal. I didn't feel anything odd or evil at that point, but the shrieking thing was certainly nothing good. Looking back, I wonder if the anger I was feeling for not being able to fall back to sleep is what drove that thing to my home. Never had anything like that happen before or since. And I'm good with that. The next story is from Pete in the U.S. Voicemail from Beyond. This happened about ten years ago. My wife and I were talking in the kitchen, and her phone rang. She looked at it and said, Hey, you're calling me. That's crazy. My phone is charging upstairs, I said. She showed me the face of her phone, and sure enough, it said that I was calling her. The call went to my voicemail, and I went upstairs to check on my phone. When I got up there, I saw that it didn't show that it had called her. So I went back downstairs, and she told me that my phone had left her a voicemail. We played the voicemail, and it sounded like an animal or something, an intense snarling and growling for about 20 seconds or so, before suddenly having the voicemail end. I went that day and bought a new phone. Maybe there's a reasonable excuse for what happened, but the thought of it still creeps me out. The next story I have is from a 1902 newspaper article. Haunted Home in Evansville, Indiana. The Evansville Courier and Press. Ghost drives tenants from their home in the West End. Evansville has a haunted house. If the story told by the family living at 1124 West Pennsylvania Street is true, those who take pleasure in delving into things of the occult can find a good field for their labors in Evansville. There are 11 members in the family who live at the alleged haunted house, and they all say that they have seen the ghost. One girl, a 12-year-old, has been carried away to her room unconscious after having come face to face with the ghastly woman in white who prowls around the house at night. 
Miss Mary Saab, one of the occupants, testifies that she had seen the nocturnal visitor a number of times. Other members of the family say they have seen the ghost and, in addition, have heard strange sounds and seen flashes of light hovering around the eaves of the building. The house claimed to be haunted is at 1124 West Pennsylvania Street, is currently occupied by Louis Shegeter, a carpenter and his family. For the last two weeks, they claim they have heard strange noises, seen mysterious lights, and the vision of a woman dressed in white. George Morris and Charles Taylor say they were passing the house several evenings ago when they saw a man enveloped in a long black Macintosh sitting on the front steps. They say he weaved back and forth and he appeared to be of great height. The two men secured arms and upon returning to look, he had vanished. The alleged haunted house was formerly occupied as a butcher shop and the family now living there are going to vacate today. And this is a story from the Daily Telegraph in March of 1957. It's really short, but I thought it was pretty good. Zigzagging lines on the walls. The Bishop of Jaro, J.A. Ramsbotham, blessed a council house in the General Havoc Road, Sunderland, last night during a service there. The occupants, Mr. and Mrs. Norman Dixon, said their home was haunted. The trouble started a fortnight ago. Mr. Dixon said that while he and his wife were asleep, they felt their bedclothes being pulled off and fingers digging into their sides. Three nights later, they told reporters, we experienced cold objects on our backs. They described the ghost as a series of zigzagging lines shimmering on the walls. If you're enjoying Anything Ghost and you'd like to hear the complete archive of Anything Ghost, again, that's 18 years of this show, then you need to join the Anything Ghost VIP group. For more information, go to anythingghost.com, join VIP. The next story took place in 1923, and it was from a newspaper article that came out in August of that year, and it reads more like a story, like a, like a piece of fiction, but apparently these uh, news reporters were sent out to investigate a haunted house, and the haunted house was in an area known as the Arroyo Seco, and a couple times I pronounce it Seco, so I apologize, and that's in the Pasadena area of California. There's a report of a haunted house in the Arroyo Seco, glared the city editor at the reporter polishing a seat. Go out there and see if you can interview a prominent ghost, and be sure and get pictures. This assignment was not covered in the journalism correspondence course, which has indexed all kinds of yarns so that reporters are able to look up a certain story in their pocket manual and find the correct form. Therefore, the reporter was slightly taken off his pins. How about taking a photographer? asked the scribe, who believed that ghost interviewers, like misery, love company, and able-bodied company at that. Not a chance, said the arbiter of the blue pencil. Spooks run large at night only, and we couldn't take a flashlight. It might scare him away. Besides, you have to stay all night, because we don't know when the ghost will walk. And last, but not least, a good photographer is too valuable. We can't run any risks with them. Can I take an artist, then? pleaded the reporter. This was agreeable, and the reporter and the artist set forth looking for the haunted house. Oh, say, blurted the city editor, before you fellows leave, fill out this blank. He handed the routine obituary forms to the two, which were filled out. They departed for Pasadena, 
where they would obtain more definite information regarding their assignment. To cheer each other up, they vented their skepticism and agreed that ghosts are products of Welsh rabbits, lobster a la Newburgh, and Long Beach hot dogs eaten late at night. It'll be great, said the reporter, to be able to show up these superstitious people in Pasadena. Sure thing, said the artist, his mind apparently on some other subject. If I heard a haunted house in the south, say Mississippi or Louisiana, there might be something to it, continued the scribe, talking to keep up his courage. But in Pasadena, people are too high-brow. They fall for this psychic and spiritualism hokum, and spook stuff in wrapping on the table. But as far as believing that old run-down houses are full of ghosts, they are too high-brow for that. Besides, there aren't any more ghosts. The high-powered real estate agents run them all out. A ghost hasn't a ghost of a show, with one of those self-starting go-getter real estate salesmen. They'd sell a nervous old maid a house full of ghosts and persuade her that She'd never saw or heard a thing. Another thing, houses are too scarce for ghosts now. People used to refuse to live in a haunted house. Now they're glad just to get any kind. Soon the amateur Conan Doyles arrived in Pasadena and proceeded to get data on the history and location of the haunted house. The history of the house was found by talking with an old-timer, whose identity is kept secret. It is something like the following. Thirty years ago, a mysterious German family lived in a two-story house half-hidden by trees on a hill in the Arroyo Seco. Some people, who were balked in their inquisitiveness to find out the family history of the Germans, gossiped that they must have been murderers or something or must have been a noble family that was exiled from Germany. At any rate, the family went about their business, minded their own garden, and continued to arouse the deepest suspicion among the residents on the neighboring hills. One day, an old German, believed to be the head of the family, appeared at the house of a neighbor, and, in excited tones, told of the death of his daughter. She had either been murdered or committed suicide, it was stated. Then the old German returned to the home, and none of the family was seen after that, not even walking around the house or working in the small garden in the rear. One of the neighbors, more courageous than others, decided to risk a trip up the steep hill to satisfy his curiosity. He sneaked close to the house and waited to see if anyone came out. Growing bolder, he went inside. In every room of the house, the same death-like quiet prevailed. Everything had been left as though the family stepped out of the house for no more than a minute. On a table in one room was set out articles of food, untouched and from the state of decay a week or so old. A trip to the barn resulted in the discovery of a horse, a mule, and a cow nearly dead from lack of food and water. In the chicken yard there were twenty chickens, half of them stiff in death. The mystery of the house grew. The strange tale passed over the region like wildfire. Days, weeks, months, and years passed without witnessing any further light on the mysterious disappearance. No one knows the straight of it to this day, according to the old-timers. How about the haunted house part of the story? prompted the artist. The old man said, Well, the talk started that the house was possessed with spirits, and lots of people have seen them too. And don't you forget, I seen them myself. I'll swear it. Armed with what they thought was sufficient history and data on the location of the house, 
The investigators proceeded a few miles, took a side road, and when this ended, plodded on foot in the direction named. After a mile or so of weary climbing along a trail up the hillside, pushing aside bushes and stumbling over rocks, they reached the house, just as the full moon burst over the jagged profile of the southern mountain range. The house lived up to all the advance notices. If any place was to be more desirable for spooks, the two could not imagine it. Located on the brow of a steep wooded hill, separated from the rest of the world by deep ravines on two sides, a long plateau on the third, and accessible only by a single footpath, the house presented an awe-inspiring appearance. The roof was caved in, the sides were falling apart, and piles of shingles and nondescript wood were deposited around by the ravages of the elements and time. In the dim distance, Pasadena lay, a sparkling myriad of lights. The pair entered the foreboding place and prepared to await. A half an hour or so spent, as is customary in waiting for ghosts, in telling yarns about apparitions that have been seen, was followed by an attempt to sleep on the hard floor. In short time both were dozing. How long they slept they were unable to tell, but awakened with a start. Soft, shuffling sounds were heard proceeding from the floor above. They were not the noises of the night, crickets, stray birds, or even rats gnawing at wood. Say, whispered the artist, did you hear that? Sure, I was just going to ask you if you did. What do you suppose it is? Shh, let's listen closer. But the noise ceased. A wait for perhaps a half an hour failed to bring a reoccurrence of the sound. They again dropped off to sleep. Again, they jumped out of slumber. Outside, a sound of scraping on wood was heard. Full-eyed with excitement, both flattened themselves on the floor in the deep shadow to avoid the light of the moon that shone through the window. Crunch, crunch, came from outside. It was as if someone was walking on the piles of loose shingles. The noise mounted and grew nearer to the aperture of the room. The opening was formerly a door, but someone had taken it off the hinges and carried it away, leaving an unprotected hole. Look, both breathed in a hoarse voice as the object passed before the door. Then a sigh of relief went up. It was a large white mule that had probably wandered from a nearby farm in search of greener grass. The investigators kidded each other about being frightened at a mule, a harmless animal, that they had thought was a ghost. A little while of joking, and they dropped off to sleep. When they awoke again, it was dawn. They arose, gathered their blankets from the floor, and retraced their steps down the hill to their car. The first person they hunted in Pasadena to tell of their remarkable discovery that the famous haunted house was not really inhabited by spooks was the old-timer who had recited the ominous history. Didn't we tell you we wouldn't see any ghosts? They proudly remarked. We stayed up there all night and didn't see anything that was in the least bit supernatural. Those people must have been cracked who claimed they saw anything. The old-timer was visibly impressed. Well, I'm glad you didn't see anything, he said. Maybe it ain't haunted anymore. But everyone that ever tried to stay in that house ran away when they saw the ghost. 
By the way, what kind of looking spook did they see? asked the artist. Did he wear a long shroud and black horn rim specks and ride a bicycle? The old sage smiled, a tolerant smile. No, he replied. It wasn't a man. It was an animal. What? They both cried. Yes, drawled the ancient savant of the arroyo. An animal, to be exact, a mule. And a white one at that. It was supposedly an animal that starved to death after the old Germans left. It's the story of the stubborn mule ghost in the Arroyo Seco area of Pasadena. And next up is a story I'm going to reshare. It's uh, self narrated by Rod in Los Angeles, and he's a makeup artist for movies and he did a lot of intros for anything ghost in the past with actress brink stevens if you recall some of those and he put this together in june of 2022 and he's going to take us on a ghost legend tour of the los angeles area so we're going to go from the arroyo seco to down to los angeles and by the way he keeps mentioning it's summertime because this was released in June of 2022. So with all that said, I hope you enjoy Rod's Ghost Tour of Los Angeles. Good evening, Lex and Anything Ghost listeners. This is Rod Matsui in Los Angeles again. It is summertime. Warm weather in California this week. Los Angeles County is made up of many little cities stitched together, and most of the area is steeped in ghost legend. When the weather gets very warm, some people have trouble sleeping, and I think it's very interesting that so many people enjoy falling asleep to ghost stories. I take a very strange pleasure in it myself, and I'm always looking for the right balance the stories that are just spooky enough but not too overly frightening because listening to really frightening stories can cause weird nightmares and even more difficulty sleeping at least for me and there's nothing like a nice bedtime story half of the fairy tales my mom read to me when I was a kid were kind of scary but there's a certain level that I like and when it goes beyond that too much or has too many gruesome details, then it's not really relaxing. Of course, there are many different kinds of voices, and certain voices just seem more pleasant and relaxing to me than others. And I acknowledge it's a very strange thing. It doesn't seem to make sense that a scary story could be relaxing, but when the elements are just right and the audience is there voluntarily, then there are a few entertainments that can satisfy quite like a spooky story. There were actually tales of a ghost or spirit that walked this neighborhood of Los Angeles, and I heard about them in the 1970s, and they were just stories. The kid across the street was two years older than me, and he had this idea that he could scare me by telling me scary stories about this ghost who returned to the area every five years to claim a victim. He called it the bloody ghost. The ghost carried a bloody knife. And because he had killed almost five years ago, he was almost due for his newest night of bloody horror. Be especially afraid looking outside your windows at night because he is out there in the darkness and the ghost may pick you. This frightened me for several weeks and had me thinking there really was a ghost with a bloody knife just walking around the area at night and it made me afraid to go over to the dark windows for fear of seeing this ghoul outside until I figured out for myself that this whole thing was a story that was made up. 
Funny how a person can be frightened by something as long as that person believes that something is real. And then there was 20 legs from 1980. This was another ghost who never really existed, but it scared us anyway. In fact, a guy named Mike actually made him up because he was bored. This was supposed to be a ghost that could chase you very fast with the speed of 10 people. If you multiplied two legs times 10 people, you'd get 20 legs. So Mike decided the ghost was called 20 legs and we would spook each other out on late evening walks to the 7-Eleven or the local donut shop down the hill where there was a pretty girl named Marine who made coffee and piroshkis, a lovely fried pastry with savory fillings inside. You cannot imagine what these things tasted like, by the way. They tasted like Disneyland especially on a cold winter's evening in the 1980s. Very lovely. But there was a price. To get there and eat that savory pastry, you had to walk all the way past the eastern side of a huge local graveyard. Graveyards have always scared me a little bit, and this one scared me when I was a kid, I think, because it was so huge and quiet. And in the 1970s and early 80s, that street was not brightly lit the way it is now, but just a dark stretch of inky shadows. There was the graveyard on one side of the street and houses on the other. You could walk on the side of the street with the houses, but often those houses were dimly lit too, and it was actually darker on that side because the trees were untrimmed and blocked the light. So, especially if you were superstitious, this walk past the graveyard was no joke. And then after you had had your donut and coffee, there was the trip back home. The walk back up the hill was always spookier and darker, and the talk of the Twenty Legs ghost would usually start about a third of the way back in the most threatening area. Anyway, 1980. That was the year I really started drinking coffee. You may know that the San Gabriel Mountains, just north of Los Angeles, have actually had some Bigfoot sightings. But I don't think that's known by many. People have seen things at some of the campgrounds there. I've been told that all the surrounding mountains Around the whole Los Angeles area are places where Bigfoot creatures have supposedly been seen at one time or another. But I remember reading in the school library about Bigfoot in 1979, and the sightings that had occurred in the San Gabriel Mountains specifically were really interesting. The library I was in was in Arcadia, right next to San Gabriel, the city and the San Gabriel Mountains are directly to the north, about a mile away. So, I was reading about some freaky Bigfoot sightings in a library not very far away from where they were reported to have happened. So yes, if you're wondering if Bigfoot has been seen in Los Angeles, well, not in the populous city, perhaps, but it has been seen in the mountains directly north, although, to my knowledge, there have been no sightings reported since the 1970s. In the 1970s, Bigfoot movies were very scary because I guess stories about people encountering these things were in the newspapers a lot. And a lot of kids growing up, especially if you lived in the woods or near the woods, thought that a Bigfoot was a fairly plausible thing to be afraid of certainly at least in the ballpark of a large bear, and those are legitimately real. I'm still not decided on this Bigfoot thing, though. I think it's still a mystery, and that's why I was reading about them in 1979. The paperback I was reading had some really weird stuff in it. Some of the stories told about the Bigfoot creatures being telepathic and communicating with the campers that way. 
and there were other extremely strange details that the book contained which suggested that if these animals existed they were not quite animals in the conventionally understood sense but akin to something in the realm of psychic phenomena or ghosts both mysterious and indefinable realms in themselves I wanted to go back briefly to the Waialae drive-in in Honolulu, Hawaii, the one that was haunted by the faceless ghost, because I did some additional research on that one, and I am very surprised. According to what I found, anyway, the drive-in was torn down and apartments and other buildings were put up there, and the faceless ghost has continued to be seen occasionally. It has been seen in the bathrooms inside a restaurant built on that ground, and it's been seen standing on a street corner at the edge of the local cemetery. So, the drive-in theater is gone, but the site is still very much active, and now the faceless woman might surprise you at one of several possible locations. She's not just confined to one bathroom anymore. Maybe tearing the theater down actually widened her area of influence and helped her rather than hindering her. Now, personally, I heard some really frightening sounds coming out of my garage once, where I had stored two big boxes of stage props. This was around 1991, when I was living in Van Nuys. And this only happened once. I'm very thankful for that. This is what happened. Okay. As I was preparing for an evening's run out to Culver City to deliver two boxes of scary masks and props to a punk rock show, I heard the strangest noises coming from the garage workshop. I had two large cardboard boxes in there full of masks and props and it sounded like everything in those boxes was being tossed violently around for two or three seconds before going quiet again. And the sounds were so loud my immediate thought was that's a wild animal. It has to be. So I opened the garage carefully and went inside and looked nothing was wrong. I couldn't find the source of that loud burst of sounds which had gone on for a couple of seconds. As soon as I closed the door again though and walked away again there was another loud burst of crashing sounds from where I had stored those masks and props. And this happened three times. Three times I went back into the garage to check because there were loud crashing sounds. I couldn't ignore them. It sounded like stuff was just being thrown around. This whole thing was unexplainable. I was never able to explain this to myself adequately. Every time I checked, you see, nothing was wrong. I couldn't find what had made the loud noises. I figured it might have been a wild animal, as there is a lot of wildlife in Van Nuys. I was worried that it might be something dangerous, like maybe a rabid raccoon. But I couldn't find an animal, or even a way one could have gotten in. Nothing was out of place or on the floor. It was like the sounds had been caused by nothing. After checking those three times and finding nothing, I was getting the feeling that something was messing around with me and I really could make no sense of it. But it just stopped after that third time, and I feel as though I should have found some source for the sounds. The fact that I didn't leads me to think that they were probably of completely unknown origin. I should point out that I've always had extremely good hearing, and the chances I made some kind of mistake seem very slim to me. This bunch of stories has been specially prepared for this summer's warm season, so cheers! Have a nice cold glass of iced tea. It's lovely chatting with you again. 
I wish you a wonderful evening. Thank you all very, very much. Take care. And that'll do it for the 18th anniversary of Anything Ghost, the Creepy 18 celebration. Okay, so if you have a story you want to share, send it to lex at anythingghost.com. And for more information about the Anything Ghost VIP group, go to anythingghost.com, join VIP. Okay, everybody, I'll talk to you in show number 310 of Anything Ghost. Until then, have yourself a wonderful week and take care.